I am happy to present to you our new generation of single core processors, Ryzen 7000. We at AMD strive to achieve an ambitious goal to make our single core processors the best choice for gamers and developers. Ladies and gentlemen, meet the new Ryzen 7100F. We live in an era when a 16 core processor in a PC would surprise you less than a single core one. Today, according to statistics, 40% of Steam users use 6 core CPUs. Meanwhile, dual core Celerons are fit for office machines at best. For this, we should thank AMD, which, back in 2005, introduced the world's first 2 core x86 Athlon X2 processor, thereby launching a core count arms race that has not stopped ever since. But let's pretend for just 15 minutes that this did not happen. In this case, the struggle for every gigahertz, which began in 1999, would still continue, and in parallel reality, there would be 10 gigahertz processors. Dual core core 2 duo and 8 core FXs would not exist. There would be no 16 core Ryzen's and 24 core core i9's. What a single core processor with a modern architecture and high frequency would be capable of today? Can it run games and productivity software, or will it struggle even launching a web browser? This is MK. Let's test the fastest single core processor in the world. Let's go. The first task of our experiment is to obtain a modern architecture single core processor. It may come as a surprise, but the last real single core processor was released in 2011. It was a very rare Celeron with hyperthreading, which by the way, we managed to find and purchase on AliExpress. Since then, all x86 processors have been at least dual core. We can do it through deep BIOS settings that allow you to disable extra cores on any processor. Yes, this leaves a huge L3 cache on, but it will not be a great help to just one core. Our test subject is a 6-core Ryzen 5 7600X. It features the most advanced AMD's architecture called Zen 4 and can turbo boost to 5.3 GHz, just what we need. We disabled 5 cores in the BIOS, but let's allow ourselves a little bit of cheating and leave multi-threading on. The thing is, it works purely on a software level. Physically, it is still just one core, and the second thread is nothing more than a result of better utilization of the computing pipeline in that core, revealing its full potential. By the way, multi-threading technology is far from new. Intel was the first to use it in its quad-core Pentiums for LGA478 back in 2004. It was a time when companies were not afraid of experimenting. This 4-core Pentium is a gift from one of our subscribers. It looks more like a video card with a socket. However, it is a full-fledged industrial board that makes it easy to change the processor to a more powerful one or replace it in case of a malfunction. Back then, the performance increase given by the second thread seldom exceeded 20%, and it's all the more interesting to find out how much the virtual core boosts performance now. Windows 10 boots on one core without any problems or warnings. And by the way, it does not load 6 times faster if you enable all the 6 cores. The increase would be only about 2 times. As you can see, even a modern OS mostly relies on one core when booting up. Although this is expected, the system requirements of Windows 10 want at least a 1 core 1 GHz CPU. So our single core Ryzen is well within that range. CPU Z shows everything the way it was meant 1 core and 2 threads. The result of the built in benchmark is not impressive by modern standards, only about 950 points on multi thread. The closest of the more or less modern CPUs is the 2 core 4 thread Athlon 200GE for AM4 and of the older ones, the 4-core Xeon for LGA775. Obviously, these are not the most desired processors out there, but keep in mind that we only got one core. CPU Z shows clearly that the second virtual core gives a tangible benefit, increasing performance by as much as 75%, and I still want to emphasize that this is a purely software feature. But Cinebench R23 made me laugh. It simply doesn't have a single core test. It amazes me that the developers of this fairly recent and demanding benchmark have thought this through. But we are more interested in the result. And surprisingly, it's not bad at all. 2200 points. This is the result of the Pentium G4560, only it has twice as many cores and threads. 
Another interesting point is the power consumption of our single core Ryzen. It is about 35 watts. According to this logic, 6 cores should consume 200 watts, but in fact, it's half as much. And all of this is because in addition to the cores, the processor also has a capacious L3 cache and an additional I.O. die that remain functional regardless how many cores are operable. So it turns out that a multi-core CPU is more energy efficient than a single core one. However, overheating is not an issue by any means. 55 degrees, which is nonsense for the hot tempered Ryzen 7000. In the 7-zip archive in Benchmark, the result is again at the level of the old 4-thread Pentiums. As for Y-Cruncher, no other CPU has a similar result there, so we will compare it with the full-fledged 7600X. The performance increase from 6 cores turned out to be almost linear, 5.5 times. Mathematical computing is easy to parallel. Wish video games were like this too. And the final benchmark is 3 mark times pi, which tests gaming capabilities of a processor. Here, the result is 1700 points, half as much as the 4-core Xeon killer Ryzen 5 1500X, which we have tested. In general, this is again the level of the dual-core Athlon 200GE, an excellent level for a single core. But tests are tests. How about checking its real work capabilities? You can serve the web without any issues, slower of course than with 6 cores, but there is no outright stuttering and the pages load rather quickly. This processor manages to play 4K videos on YouTube. Just a reminder, this is a single core processor. Messengers and the office apps are fast, system utilities are even more so, here the animations are slower than their loading speed. In fact, this is a good enough machine for productivity tasks. I made the preview for this video in Photoshop using this one core setup. I cut these footages in 2K in Adobe Premiere in order to send them to our tag guy. Yes, it's 2023 and the Adobe software can still run on one core. Finally, the most interesting question to our Ryzen 7000. Is it capable of running modern games? We will run our tests using 32GB of fast DDR5 memory, all software is installed on an NVMe SSD, and the GPU is the RTX 3080 Ti. There are simply no better conditions for this processor. Let's change our tradition a bit and start the tests not with Cyberpunk, but with free-to-play online games. These games are properly optimized to run on any potato PC, and our single-core Ryzen is the one. Let's start with Dota 2 in 2K at low graphics settings. We were recommended to launch a replay of the International 12 Finals, our champions Team Spirit vs GG. Team Spirit then won the first place in 1.4 million, which is 3.5 times less than what it was when they beat the Swedish Team Liquid. And the game managed to surprise. And twice. Firstly, even on one core, the CPU is not fully loaded. Secondly, the frame rate is often above the 100 FPS bar. Yes, the frame time graph is uneven, but in general, it's quite playable. There are no stutters and unresponsive controls, for a player like myself, that is. If desired, you can lock the frame rate at 60. This will solve some of the problems with frame drops. As for World of Tanks, it doesn't need more than one core, really. It runs in 2K Ultra. The one core is not even fully loaded, which is surprising and the frame rate is at about 100. Nothing to complain about. It's quite comfortable to play, although sometimes there are stutters, while the controls always remain responsive. Ok, our one-core CPU is not bad at all when it comes to eSports. However, this was evident even when running benchmarks. The results were comparable to those of 4-thread Athlon and Pentium, which are definitely worthy low-budget processors. But how does a one-core Ryzen handle modern AAA games? Since it was temporarily free, let's launch Diablo 4 at lowest settings. All games will be tested in 2K. I don't know if it can be called playable, see for yourself. On the one hand, the processor performs at its best, and the frame rate rarely drops below 60. On the other hand, the frame time graph can sometimes get real bad, so it's worth turning on the FPS lock at 60 to slightly unload the CPU. This helps get rid of stutters almost completely. They happen much less often, and it is much more comfortable to play this way. So just a side note for you, locking frame rate through the NVIDIA control panel sometimes does help. The beautiful Forza Horizon 5 was the only game that gave us a warning message about an unsupported CPU. And for a good reason. It doesn't even load into the main menu. But we don't give up so easily, so let's make it a bit easier for the processor by locking the frame rate at 60. 
and voila, now there are no problems with Forza. The game was developed for the previous generation of consoles, so a couple of fast Zen 4 threads are enough for it to produce an almost stable 60fps, albeit with some stutters. Doom Eternal. This is probably the next Doom game that will be launched on microwaves and fridges in the nearest future. Even at Ultra and with ray tracing, the game does not forget its roots from the 90s and runs perfectly well on one core, producing above 60fps. Yes, stutters do happen, but they are quite rare and they do not interfere much with the gameplay, especially since the controls remain as responsive as ever. The only issue is this kind of sound. And again, this is fixed by reducing the load on the CPU through the FPS lock at 60. The result is a nearly perfect gameplay with a nice picture and sound. But after launching Cyberpunk, I was even surprised at how well it was optimized. Yes, after two years, the Polish have actually managed to polish the game, and one core of a recent Ryzen CPU is able to produce almost 60 FPS at low and about 50 at high graphic settings, but only in the benchmark. The real gameplay in the city location can do nothing but upset. The frame rate sometimes drops below 30 and the stutters are constant. Even locking the frame rate at 30 FPS doesn't help it. The same awful frame time graph and quite noticeable stuttering, and this at the lowest settings. Since at least it was able to launch Cyberpunk, we will also try out the most difficult test, the PC port of The Last of Us. This game is extremely demanding on the processor, and even some not the oldest 4-core CPUs can hardly handle it. However, surprisingly, the game actually launched. But the frame rate, especially in some of the demanding locations, was what we can call cinematic at best, with a terrible frame time graph. Therefore, the 30 FPS limit won't help the game. But even such a terrible gameplay experience did not prevent me from actually playing it for a bit. And if it got you thinking that since this single core Ryzen 7100 could somehow run The Last of Us, it means one core can actually run everything. But alas, there were many misfires during the test. For example, Atomic Heart, which is not exactly the most demanding game of the bunch, refused to run at all. Apparently, more than two threads are required for Unreal Engine 4 to work properly. The Plague Tale Requiem similarly displayed an error when starting up. Counter-Strike 2, what the heck are you doing? The updated version of this game is unplayable. Consider yourself lucky if you manage to load into a match. This single core experiment actually surprised me. We are used to the fact that two core processors are the low end, office machines. And even four core CPUs are a thing of the past. I mean, when we're talking about some demanding games or any other demanding workloads, and I thought that the limit of a one-core Ryzen would be surfing the web and using Office apps or something. But one fast core in 2023 can easily run 4K videos, edit videos, and play games. And this was a real discovery for me. At the same time, the processor actually ran cool, which is not natural for modern Ryzens without undervolting. Then why would AMD and Intel abandon single-core, and in the case of AMD, even dual-core? Heck, even quad-core. After all, we know that companies shamelessly engage in binning, disabling fully working cores to create several processor lineups. And the only conclusion that makes sense is that one core CPUs are unprofitable. Let's take a moment and remember some high school maths. The Ryzen 9 7900X has 12 cores and a 6 nanometer I.O. die. They cost $550. For an additional 4 cores in the Ryzen 9 7950X, you will have to pay 150 bucks. It means that AMD estimates one core at $37.5, hence we find out that the I.O. die costs $100. In this case, a single core Ryzen will cost $140, and this despite the fact that two core Pentiums are almost twice as cheap. Most likely this is the reason why there are no new 4 core Ryzen CPUs. Such a processor would cost about $250 and this is absolutely uncompetitive compared to Intel, which offers a 4-core i3-12100 for only $140. At the same time, even two Zen 4 cores are quite enough for modern games. In this mode, our Ryzen turns out to be at the level of the legendary overclocked 4-core i7-2600K. Therefore, driving around the city in Cyberpunk doesn't cause a desire to turn off the game, and the demanding PC port of The Last of Us, with the frame rate lock at 60fps, gives an almost smooth picture. 
Here is a fun fact for you. We have not seen any single core CPUs for about 10 years now, including because of capitalist greed. And we can hardly complain. This was MK. My name is Mikhail Krashen. I'll see you again. Bye.